Good afternoon. Welcome to Talks at Google. Today it's my great pleasure to introduce local author, local to Boston, Heidi Pittler. Heidi. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Heidi. My pleasure. No, our pleasure. <laughs> no, mine. We'll, okay. we'll just go back. <laughs> Actually, this is Heidi's second time here. She was here last week for David Duchovny as our guest. Um, Heidi worked for nine years as an editor at Houghton Mifflin. Um, since then, she's worked for another nine years as co-editor of the Best American Short Stories of the Year. So you've probably read more short fiction, at least American short fiction, than anybody else probably anywhere can claim. I hope so. <laughs> if anyone else is, reads more, I think they need help. <laughs> right. I need help, so they definitely need help. Right. She's also found time to write two novels, The Birthdays, and her most recent novel, which you have copies of, uh, The Daylight Marriage, which I read in advance, and um, in another month or two I may recover from reading. Uh, it's pretty strong stuff. Uh, should be available only with a prescription or to people. <laughs> over, I don't know what, 18, 16, 14, it's, um, it's seriously, it's powerful stuff. Uh, so with no further ado, Heidi. Well, thank you again for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I thought I would read, well, I'll, I'll sum up the book for you, and I thought I would read a few pages just to give you a sense of it, and then maybe we can talk about it or anything else you might want to talk about today. Um, so this novel is about a married couple. They've been married for a long time. Um, they have a 15-year-old and an 8-year-old. A 15-year-old daughter named Janine and an 8-year-old son named Ethan. Um, their marriage has grown strained. They are not super thrilled with each other anymore. And the book starts out with them getting into an argument, um, a heated, you know, your typical married couple being pushed to the extreme argument. Um, so where I'm going to start is, uh, the, the characters' names are Lovell, Lovell is the husband and Hannah is the wife. Um, they have just finished their argument. Hannah has run off into the son's room, whose name is Ethan, and I'm going to read um, Lovell's, we're, we're with Lovell now, uh, the aftermath of the fight, the, the moments after in, in his mind. He faced Hannah's pillow, bunched into a ball in its ivory case at the far corner of the mattress. The poison that they had kept stored away inside themselves, this toxic stew that had expanded for years, had finally boiled over and out. Janine pushed the door open an inch and leaned her face forward. She peered around the room. Her hair sat in a brutalized tangle at the top of her head. You all done? she asked. Yes, he said, unable to face her right now. Let's get you back to sleep, he managed. If he was able to seem calm and steady, she might believe that he was. I wasn't sleeping, she said, keeping herself behind the door as he approached. Of course not. I'm sorry. That was no good. He had learned that the more he tried to explain away their battles to her, the worse they sounded. Where's mom, she asked. Hannah slept in Ethan's room whenever he had trouble sleeping, which was most nights. Probably in your brother's room. Janine stepped, caref stepped carefully around the door and in front of him. Is she okay, she asked. His daughter could be surprisingly maternal toward Hannah. Your mother's fine, he said automatically. I'm fine too, he added, not that she had asked. He followed her to her bedroom. He tucked her in, although she flinched at his touch, and then he sat beside her on her mattress. At last, she closed her eyes. He stayed a moment, looking down at his daughter, the wisps of light hair across her temple, her lips barely parted as she lay there on her side. She may not have been sleeping. She may have been pretending, but he did not say anything. He was grateful that she allowed this right now, that she was letting him just stay here and look at her. The early days, those first few months of friendship, when all that he knew of Hannah Monroe fit inside a daydream. She had grown up on Martha's Vineyard and now lived alone in one of her parents' two off-island homes, a four-bedroom brownstone on Clarendon, where a tree-sized grandfather clock stood guard just inside the front door. 
She kept a rosewood box of Burdick's honey caramel truffles on her coffee table at all times. She collected antique glass perfume bottles that were rounded and spiny, swirled with primordial indigo and deep opaque emerald. She was passionate about the Red Sox, but hated the, hated the Patriots and football in general. She gave the impression of a swan, regal but fragile, lovely and thoughtful and capable of sudden wildness. She was the most fem feminine, self-assured, compelling female that he had ever met. She called him one night with a ticket to a game against the Blue Jays the next afternoon. My friend just backed out. I'd have called you sooner, she began. He immediately accepted, and because she had a car and he did not, they agreed that she would come pick him up before the game. The next afternoon, she arrived at his apartment in Brighton wearing a ski jacket, her neck swaddled in a lumpy, hairy scarf. Her nostrils were pink and inflamed, and she sounded congested. Had he missed it over the phone? He led her inside and offered to make her some tea. We don't have to leave the second, do we, he asked. No, she shrugged, not just yet. He hung up her jacket while she unraveled her scarf. He filled a mug with water and put it in the microwave. They sat across from each other at the wobbly card table in his kitchen. Down the hall, his roommate Paul labored with his trombone scales, unable to reach the higher notes. Hannah's hair pulled down onto her shoulders and ran over her small breasts, down over her stomach, stopping at her waist. She had these light-filled eyes, and a black eyelash clung to the side ridge of her nose. She made considerable attempts to sniff back all that was inside her sinuses. He went to find a box of tissues, and when he returned, he asked, you sure you're up for a baseball game outside? I'll be fine. The season's almost over. We have to go. Thanks, she said, as she reached for the box. She asked, have you ever been in love? Her crazy questions, always non sequiturs, still blindsided him. I'm not sure. I don't think so, he said. Paul groaned and started again at the beginning of his scale. The microwave beeped and Lovell found a box of Lipton that Paul's mother had left on her last visit. Lovell set the mug down before Hannah and she brought it to her mouth for a dainty sip. The table tottered beneath her arm and she wrapped her fingers around the mug to protect the tea or her lap. He found an empty box of frosted flakes with the recycling, folded it into awkward fourths and jammed it under the shortest table leg. Once he took his seat again, she looked off beyond him. So what exactly does it feel like, he said at last. Oh, you'd know, she said. That's what they always say, you just know, he said. The trombone grew louder, a whiny, embarrassing little brother in the next room. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. The first night I met him, we slept together, she said. This jerk named Doug Bowen had been her fiance just a few months ago. She talked about him a lot. And the next night too, she said. I probably shouldn't admit that. How to respond? Anyway, Lovell had a chemical oceanography paper due the next day. He should have been finalizing his isotope indicators. Proofreading. He had a hundred things he should have been doing other than sitting here with this girl. She said, you've never done that? Slept with someone right away? She made one last heartbreaking attempt to breathe through her nose. He had, but he didn't think it was love. Nothing like that. What's the right answer, he said. There's no right or wrong, she said. Well, I guess there was this one girl and we almost did. We got really close, he said. But I didn't want to hurt her later on, so I held off. I mean, we both did. Ah, uh, the right answer anyway, she said. He watched her guide the tea bag around the water by its paper tag. He was a gawky, long-limbed PhD candidate from semi-rural Maine. He was allergic to shellfish, and in his rare time, rare free time, he did little other than monopolize his roommate's Nintendo. She was light years out of his league. Now the wrong answer, she said. Yes, we went ahead and slept together, but I didn't really love her, he said. Tell me more, she said. She, he began. A section of his chest withered. He felt protective of it. No. No, she said. He shook his head. Good for you, she said and nodded. Really, it's none of my business. She finished her tea and drew a deep breath, this time through her mouth. She sat up straighter and looked at him anew, as if only now realizing he was in the room with her, Lovell, and not someone else. You're a good person, aren't you, she said. I try, he said. She studied his face, side to side, up and down. I could use a good person. I need someone good in my life right now, she said. 
good, he said sadly. He had landed on that brotherly side of the spectrum. Oh, she said. Oh, what? His face was hot. It was too late. Nothing, she said carefully. But she half smiled, embarrassed, maybe hopefully intrigued. Are we ready to go? Now, Lovell checked one more time to see whether both cars were in the driveway. When he saw that they were, he headed downstairs for his laptop and answered some work emails. There would be no point trying to fall asleep after this night. He skimmed the newspaper, considered finding his banjo, which he had not played in a few years. He flipped through some magazines. He eventually made his way back upstairs and into bed. Later, he heard the Mechaner kid on his bike outside and the smack of newspapers landing on driveways, as well as the sound of the milk trucks screeching down Winter Street, that compact, joyless, bovine woman, Hannah's term, it had made him howl, who left bottles of organic milk on people's porches once a week. In the morning, Hannah remained steely for the brief time that he saw her before he had to leave for work. But she allowed him to give her a quick kiss goodbye, and he hoped this might be a precursor to a truce. He turned his thoughts to all that lay ahead of him at his office. The numbers from Pago Pago would screw up his estimates of potential intensity of tropical cyclones. Hurricane Katrina had garnered him and his theory some attention, but still there were plenty of naysayers in the government. Lovell arrived at Mass Environmental, and the day began. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. Sure. Love the prose. Oh, thank you. So. <clears throat> Curious, I'd like to get into the differences between short fiction and extended fiction. Sure. You're a novelist, but you've spent most of your career at this point, or a significant part of it, basically judging short fiction. Uh, yes. When you were an editor at Houghton Mifflin, did you work a lot with short fiction, or did you sort of just sort of stumble into short fiction? Well, I think, you know, before I worked at Houghton Mifflin, I got my MFA at Emerson College. And most writing students start out by studying short fiction, and because it's a very workshopable form. It's a very digestible form. Um, so I guess I started with short stories, and that might have been my true love. Um, when I became an editor, I did work on short story collections and novels. I did a little nonfiction, but um, because I worked with a, lo a lot of new writers, that tends to be the form people start out with. So I did some of them. Um, and it's the, you know, a story collection is not the preferred form. <laughs> it, it wasn't then, it's not now. Publishers kind of say, that's great, do you have a novel after that? Mm -hmm. um, so that is, a, you know, tends to be a, the way to get some writers in the door. Um, I was an assistant but worked on a book called The Interpreter of Maladies. Oh, sure. And, um, it was so gratifying to see that this was a story collection. We published it as paperback original. It was a very modest acquisition. And it doesn't matter what form it is, writing, great writing, I think, is great writing. And I still feel that way. Um, I, you know, my day job is short fiction. My writing is longer fiction. But um, in my mind, it's, it, it, they're almost interchangeable. I think you know, it's, it's more about the writing to me and the prose and the, the quality of it than the, the form that it comes in. Yeah, I've always imagined, and I've never gone through writing programs, so I could be completely misinformed, but I've always imagined that it, the short story as a form always require, has always required a, a different skill set or always has its own set of rules as opposed to longer fiction. Is there any truth to that? Yeah, I mean, it's such a different feeling to write. I think I, I always say writing a novel is like, at the beginning of writing a novel, you walk into a big, empty house. And you think, oh, I have to fill all these rooms. And when you're writing a story, you're in a room. And you, you know, usually you can see at least one or two walls, a closet. You know kind of what the, you can sense what the parameters are. Um, I think in novels, so many new writers stumble when they are over ambitious and you think I've got to fill this whole damn house I you know I, let's throw in it, let's throw in some history let's throw in a lot of characters I think you see a lot of novelists really stuffing it full because of that fear when you walk in that fear of emptiness of white space on the page um, I'm forgetting what your question was <laughs> <Just> basically <laughs> 
differences in both the potentially both the form of the short right. story and the skills required to right. produce both forms. You know, they're different and I do think writers tend to either fall on one side of the 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 wall or the other. You're either a short story writer or a novel writer. In short stories, obviously every word matters more. Um, there's not the room for tangents and digressions that there is in, in novels. Um, you know, the flip side of that is in novels, there's that, there's a lot of space to fill. You know, I think um, it was really interesting writing this book because it's, it's short and it's, I think, kind of tight. There's, there, you know, I, I cut away a lot of the, the digressions that were in there earlier. Um, maybe this is kind of a hybrid okay. or what's called a novella, but um, <laughs> it's being published as a novel. Um, so, yeah, it, there's a different, there's, I'm not sure if I'd say it's a different skill set or a different mindset. I think it's a very different mindset, and some people are more comfortable in one than in the other. Um, I've seen a lot of story writers make the transition awkwardly. I've seen a lot of novelists you just try and squeeze themselves into short stories, and I, you can tell a lot of times. Okay. Granted, that's my job, and all I do is read short stories, and I'm very critical of this stuff, but I do think you can tell where people's comfort level is. Okay, commercially speaking, and I <clears throat> know I won't identify the person, but I know there's at least one person in this room who's an aspiring fiction writer. Oh, good. Um, you mentioned that at Houghton Mifflin, at least, and I assume most publishers, that if I understood correctly, it's easier to get published as a novelist than as a short story writer. What advice would you give the aspiring writer of fiction? Because I, I can also imagine going the route of publishing short stories in journals, you know, McSweeney's right. in different places, and then possibly having done that, you know, outlining a novel, you know, workshopping that and going to a publisher and saying, yeah, I have these short story credits, you know, here are three chapters right. and an outline, what do you think, or going to an agent, say, I mean, is that a legitimate you, way you to know, go? You that, know, that's the standard route, is to write short stories, to try to get them published, and then, or win some awards, or do some residencies. There are all these great writing centers, Grub Street in Boston, there's Bread Loaf, there's a lot of different um, residencies and programs you can apply to. So to sort of go that route, writing short stories, gather some credits, um, try to find an agent, you know, put together a collection, usually you'll be asked to write a novel. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of, I don't think breaking rules as much as following what it is that you really want to write. So if you want to write stories, by all means, go that route. It's not easy to get stories published. I'm not sure why exactly that is. There's a ton of, of literary magazines out there. But it's really hard to get stories published. I, you know, I've talked to umpteen writers. When I used to write stories, I had a hard time finding people really? to publish them. Um, it's, a, it's a funny world, and I'm not sure if it's because a lot of the magazines are published by um, universities, so you get grad students reading the piles of uh, stories that come in, and they you know, might not have a sense of, if a story is trying to take a risk, you, know, you see less risky stuff out there in some of the journals. Mm. Um, but to go back to the question, I think it's important to figure out what you really want to write. If you want to write you know, a science fiction novel and that is your end goal, screw it, get to that. <laughs> you know? If you yeah. want to write a prose poem and that's, you know, you have to find where that energy is, where that thing that keeps you interested is. There, it's hard these days. Who wants to write? There's so much to distract us. You at Google should know this. Um, it's, you know, the whole world is full of attention thieves. So you have to find what is just gripping to you and, and allow yourself to write that, I think, no matter what it is. Um, there's always going to be prescribed routes to go about this and that. And then you hear these stories of people, you know, the most successful people didn't go that route. J.K. Rowling, you know, people who sort of sure. wrote on the sly. I think, again, um, the key is to figure out what works for you and to respect your own inner voice in a way. It's a hard thing to do these days, but I think it's important. Okay. Now, in terms of the best American short fiction of the year, you typically work with well-known writers, most recently Pulitzer Prize winner Jennifer Egan to yes. produce those. Um, 
do they pull their weight or are they just big names to put on the covers? <laughs> you don't have to answer that honestly. How, how does the process work? They definitely pull their weight. I, I mean, I have a different weight. So what I do is I get, I read everything that's published in a calendar year by an American journal that is distributed, which encompasses a huge amount. Um, how many stories would that I be? I read between oh. three and 4,000 a year. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm wow. really picky and critical and awful. I'm kind of your worst nightmare reader because I have kids and I write and I, don't, I have no patience. So either you know I'm with you on page one or two or forget it. Um, so I read all these stories. They all get sent to me. They've, they've, they just come in. I'm on everybody's list, circulation list. I read them all. I pull 120 of them and then I send those to my guest editor who pulls 20, they pick 20. And everyone's different, we work together, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, they're the big name, I let them decide how the process should go. But um, it's, it's the world's greatest job, it really is. It's, I, it's a, you know, I get to be in a one-on-one -on -one book club with just an, incredib an incredibly successful and talented writer every year and have it be someone different. Um, it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's completely, wow. completely fascinating. Their processes are all different. Um, I never know what to expect. When I started this job, I thought, oh, I'm going to, you know, Alice Siebold, who wrote The Lovely Bones, I pulled all these stories, you know, violent stories about kids and girls, and, and none of them. She just, you know, <laughs> she was really into historical fiction, and I thought, oh, this is, I have no idea, you know. So then I began to just sort of say, we need to, I just need to rely on my gut, pick things that I like not try to please the other person, which is such a good life lesson some, sometimes. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, it's really unpredictable each year, but there's a lot of reading, and, and they do a lot of reading too. They have to read 120 of these stories and pick 20, and some years it's easier than others. There's a lot, of, there can be a lot of back and forth between us. Sure, but ultimately the 20 that they pick are the ones that will go in the book. Yes. Yes, and they're and they're the they write a forward. I write a no. I write a forward. They write an introduction, mm -hmm. and they're the ones who. It's kind of nice for me because if people complain about the stories, I say, well, blame Jenny Egan. I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> nice not to have the full load rest on me. Sure. <laughs> Always good to have a backup. Yes. yes. Anything else you want us to know about anything else you do? Oh, my God. Uh, well, okay, yeah, everybody sit back. Totally open-ended. No. Um, I don't think so. Do you guys have any questions? Maybe that, it's always, I always like knowing what you want to hear, so I'm not yammering into the ether so much. So go ahead. Yeah, I would love to ask you a question about this book. I have read some reviews and the plot, and I understand this is very emotional and very hard on the reader in a sense. And I really look forward and also a little bit afraid. And you know, I imagine a lot of readers can relate to it because people are in a relationship, people tend to argue, people tend to have remorse of their arguments and and usually it doesn't go that bad but but, but this is like living out I'm not honest, this is like not living out a fantasy but reading about some characters and seeing what happens if, if and this might be a really, a really good lesson for us. But even if I don't learn anything from the book, if I enjoy it, then it's worth reading. I was wondering what made you choose such an intense emotional subject? Um, how did you weigh the risk of having something that readers take months to recover from? Uh, and also, how did you cope emotionally with, with the burden of having to to be in the position of the characters and having to write it out and go back over and over and rewrite the text and like really reliving what they are living through in the book? And what did it mean for you? What 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 did it mean for you to to write from the point of view of these characters? Right. Um, so a few answers. Um, so I, I wrote my first book, it was published in 2006, and it is a novel about a family full of pregnant people. <laughs> um, and it's kind of a family drama, it's set on an island in Maine. And after I published it, some, a well-known writer came up to me and he said, you know what I love, what, 
you know what I love about a book? And I said, what? He said, well, I usually like when something happens. <laughs> and I said, wow, thanks. I just kind of turned purple and crept away. But it stuck with me, and I thought, it, you know, it was, I love my first book, but it, it doesn't have a huge plot. It was more of a psychological exploration of a family. And I thought, I wouldn't mind writing a, like a Big Bang book, just where, some, you know, it had something really, it, it's always been important to me, and this sounds really basic, but to keep your reader turning pages. It's a really fundamental thing. I think a lot of readers lose sight of that. The, once again, these days, there are so many distractions out there. You know, a lot of people aren't reading as much as, as they used to, and it's important to keep your reader engaged. So I had that in the back of my mind. After my first book, um, I got pregnant with twins, and my husband and I lived out in a small town, and I took this new job, and I was just kind of homebound with twins, um, and it, which was really hard on me. We were isolated, we were kind of out what felt like out in the middle of nowhere. Um, it was a strange place to be. All I knew is I wanted to write something that had a big story. And around this time, there was um, the Lacey Peterson story was in the news a lot. And I started noticing there's all these stories of these very beautiful women who go missing and something grisly happens to them. And why, why are they getting so much coverage? Why are these stories getting so much coverage? So I kind of dipped a toe in this story. And then soon, maybe a month later, um, a woman who lived in my town was shot. She and her baby, who were her young baby, were shot in her bed by her British husband, and the press just flooded into our town. And I was like a crazy person. I was completely obsessed with this case. I, they lived less than a mile and a half from us. Um, our town center, a nice little bucolic town green, filled up with reporters. And I watched this whole thing, and I, it just kind of got under my skin. And I thought, what is with this? Why? Why has this become a dark fairy tale for us? Why do we? Why does? Why do people lap this up? The media, the readers. Why do I care? You know, I'm sort of a smart person. I'm literary. I don't, you know, usually read tabloid news so much. But I could not get enough of this case. So I, that was my indoor to this story. I had these things swirling around in my head, um, and I started writing it. And the darker story was really part of a backstory as I was writing the first few drafts. It was, uh, there was a nicer, happier story around it, which eventually fell away <laughs> um, with the help of my editor, who saw that the book really was about the darker, more uncomfortable story. And it, it was OK to let that sit alone on the page. Um, I didn't set out for it to be this emotional and this intense. I think it needed to be. It's a weird thing as a writer. Um, and it probably sounds a little bit crazy, but a book needs to be a certain thing. Your characters speak to you in a way that can override what your needs are. And so this thing kind of took over my life for so long. It was very painful to write, but it was also when I had finished it in the way that it needed to be finished, it was incredibly rewarding. And I felt nervous because I thought, oh God, I'm gonna send this dark thing out into the world. But I also thought of many other dark books that did OK. I think people can handle intensity. And I think it's important um, to trust your reader. I think um, not enough you know, people in various businesses do. And I think people, at the end of the day, want to be moved. They want catharsis in their reading. So maybe this was all just justification, but I clung to it. <laughs> and now we have <laughs> this book. So if that answers that. Any other questions? Anything anyone wants to talk about? Actually, I have one more, and it just Great. touched on, I mean, taking off from your question. Um, certainly, there are at least a few superficial similarities to another dark book. You know where I'm going with this, mm -hmm. which uh, has gotten. I have no idea where. <laughs> well, you might have heard there was a book that was on the Times bestseller list for about 19 or 20 years, right. seemingly uh, called <laughs> Gone Girl, and I, oh, I think one. they might have right. made a little movie about yes. it. And there, there are a few, at least superficial resemblances yes. between your book and that one. Yeah. Is that something that um, you know came up during the editing process or the publishing process with you? That's a great question. So, um, yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. It, so I, this book took me a long time to write. And Gone Girl was published, I'm not sure what year, but a few years into my writing yeah. it. And I thought, uh oh, you know, I don't, I read it. 
and right away I thought this is such a different book. I think Gone Girl is an edgy, wonderful, mystery thriller, um, funner kind of ride of a book. Mine has been called a mystery or thriller and I don't really think it is. I think it's suspenseful and I think I feel I always feel a little pretentious using the word literary but I think it's literary and suspenseful and psychological but it's not um, it's, it's not Gone Girl in any way. I mean, the first five pages, maybe there's the, a similar premise, but it goes in such a wildly different direction. Yeah. That said, it's been hard having that out there. It feels like the person in the room, you know, the 800-pound the gorilla that's hanging out with me <laughs> during yeah. this whole time. I love Gone Girl. I thought it was wonderful. I love the movie. Um, this isn't that book. And I think sure. people keep, there's a, lot, there's a lot of desire out there to say this is the next Gone Girl or this is, the next whatever big book out there and you know as a writer you can't pay attention to that y you know unless it is the same book once I had read it I felt better but yeah there have there's been a lot of comparisons made in the press and and I worry that that together with there's a lovely quote from Stephen King on the front I worry that the Gone Girl comparison together with this great Stephen King quote is going to mislead people so um, but at the end of the day, I guess that's not my job. My job is to write a book and worry about the writing. And then at this point, it's, it's yours. It's, it's for the readers. And I go away and shield myself a little bit, <laughs> hopefully. Um, so that's what I'll say about that. OK. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Have you got any ideas for a new, another book? Or? You know, I do. And I'm always nervous to talk about it too soon. But I do, and it's much lighter. I, I kind of feel like I need a vacation after this one. Um, and I worry it might be so light that there'll be no, you know, if there's a reader that likes this, they won't like that. But again, you can't care about, you have to just write what you want to write. So um, I, I just, my, my main idea is that it's about happiness and the search for happiness, which will probably mean it'll turn into something horrible and unhappy, <laughs> knowing me. But I'm going to try. <laughs> I need a lighter experience. Anything else? Um, Any other questions? Go ahead. Um, your description of your job, you seem to read something like five, six, seven, eight short stories a day, yeah. I guess, which uh, brings me to a question. When usually when I finish a book, be it a short story or a novel, I need to take a few, it doesn't matter what it is about, I just need to take some pay my respect to the book by just waiting for a few days before I switch yeah. to another book. And I was wondering how you managed to do this context switching so fast five times a day. I know, so I have to do mini switches or palette cleansers as I call them and this is what's made me an absolute Twitter and Facebook junkie because it's the perfect amount of time. You know, I'll read a story, if I read the whole story, so if I read a whole story, my computer's there, puts around on Twitter and Facebook for a bit, get the mind out, because I can't afford to take a, a longer chunk of time. There's just too much to read. Um, at the end of my reading year, I always it always is this avalanche. And no matter how much I try and stay on top of it through the year, there's just this growing pile that is sitting there at the end of the year. And there's there's a few less, you know, palate cleansers in there. And you just you learn to do it after a while. But you also learn to sort of accept the fact that you know, you're human, that you're not perfect. And, you know, I always feel kind of like, I, you just feel strange about how, who am I to decide what the best American short story is. At some point, all of us just say, well, you're, I'm going to do the best I can, and I'm going to accept my shortcomings. And um, there are days where I'm in a bad mood. And unfortunately, if I'm reading your story, that's, you know, that's the way the world works. Like any job, there are days where my kids are driving me crazy or are sick, and I have to read with, um, the TV blaring and the, you know, the water pipes broken or something. And I've sort of, I've, you know, I'm going into my 10th volume. So I've learned to forgive myself in a lot of ways and to at least try to accept my imperfections on the job. Um, but that said, Twitter and Facebook are, are my friends <laughs> for palate cleansing. Anyone else have any other questions? Go ahead. So between the two seems orthogonal tasks of kind of like reading and reviewing and, and, and authoring, do you find it hard to kind of create a good dividing line here where yes. you're not like where, where ideas from one and aren't kind of leading into the other? 
Absolutely. I think the best thing to do is to write first in the day. I drop my kids off at school and then go write. Because if I read first, other voices get into my head. Um, I try to have a time separation, whether it's lunch, you know, go run an errand or something. But it's really easy to, gra to even subconsciously grab onto a voice or a phrase or a character and have it worm its way through without even realizing it. Um, and you know, the other thing that I think is hard is that my day job makes me a really critical reader. So it's hard not to be hard on myself as a writer. Um, it's much easier for me to revise than to produce new work. Um, it's hard to get in, when you're in that generative space, you have to, it's almost like being in a dream state. You can't, you have to turn off every critical voice in your head or you're not going to produce anything. So that's gotten harder for me over the years. Um, and I revised this for long enough that um, it's been a while. So writing this new book feels a little bit like I've been put in a sandbox with no toys and I kind of have to figure it out. It's, it's tough, but I, hopefully I'll be able to get back in the mode of it. Any other questions, concerns, fears? I have one more. Oh, and one more. Go ahead. Go. Um, okay. I was just wondering, I, I would guess you would be past this stage if it ever happened, but at any point in this career, have you ever had editors or agents or writers themselves say the equivalent of, hey, please don't read this story of mine when you know your kids are driving you crazy or something. I know you've read 10 <laughs> stories of mine the last five years, but this is the one. Oh, yes. No, people, I have authors send me stuff. And I again, I'll read anything that was published. So, sure. um, but they don't get to say when I read it. I think it's like oh, any sure. award, you know, I, it's the unfortunate luck of the draw. I have definitely had people send me notes saying this is the best story by this author. And none of them are, you know, it's, you can't you can't really take any of it in. You have to. Sure. Um, and I think I've gotten to the point where you know if I I used to my kids used to play soccer at this indoor soccer place. It was the loudest, smelliest, <laughs> nastiest space, and I'd sit there reading my stories, and all the other moms were chatting away. And I think I got really good at at telling right away. This is a good story, or this isn't. You can you can it becomes this automatic thing where you just it's you know there's a, a switch flicked or not. And it becomes easier and easier the more you do it. Um, yeah. But people do. People rally politics. a little bit. Yeah. Um, and, and they're allowed to rally all they want, but yeah. I'm, it's not going to make any difference to me. Sure. Did you have a question? So as someone who's read like a ton of stories, uh, it sounds like you have a good sense for what it is that makes a good story. From from like my perspective as a much less avid reader, like there is always this this conflict between a story that's really strong throughout, and then the ones that just evoke like one piece of imagery that no matter how little I'm enjoying it during the reading, like two years later I'm still like revisiting that image. Are there? Do you find that, that correlation is there, or that like inverse correlation perhaps, or something like that? Kind of the ones that stick with you the most versus the ones that are actually. They do. I think I'm, you know, I, I've started to think of my, in this very unromantic term, my head is a computer that's getting really stuffed. So I don't remember as much as I used to. Um, when you're reading, I, I also should say, I'm, um, Houghton Mifflin is publishing a book called 100 Years of the Best American Short Stories, and that's coming out in October. So along with reading three to 4,000 of the regular stories a year, for the past three or four years, I've read every volume of the book to put together this. So this computer chip, whatever, is fried. I mean, there's just not a lot of you know, specific imagery that I'm sitting around thinking of. But um, for my favorite stories, it's true. There are moments that stick with you. There are lines that stick with you. Um, what do I think makes a strong story? Um, confident writing, natural writing. Um, I wish there were more humor out there. I, I like risk taking. I'm a big fan of um, melding of genres, of um, sci-fi, of dystopia, or of humor or mystery, um, as well as literary fiction. Um, I like anything that fe feels inventive um, or new or important or relevant. Um, I wish more people wrote stories about technology and science and um, the economy. The, it, there, there are certain, you know, it's funny, in short fiction, um, news or content of the day it takes a while to penetrate short fiction. So now I'm reading a lot of stories about the Iraq war. 
So I always feel like I'm reading the shadow of what's happening in the real world because it takes writers a while to to digest and, and to properly digest what's going on in the world and make sense of it and turn it into art, obviously. Um, but yeah, that's, that's basically what I look for, I think. Um, that said, good writing is good writing. I think um, I'm always surprised when I like a story that is about nothing, that's just a great voice or has great imagery or characters. Um, that, that is incredibly gratifying, too. Thank you so much for coming. This was really fun. Thank you.